Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for an interesting presentation on considerations and solutions for simplifying remote radio unit or RRU deployments. I'm John Salantano with the Strategic Marketing Team at Tesco. I will be your moderator for today's webinar featuring ComScope, who will be, who will be discussing network modernization with the Heliax Fiber Feed Direct, that is a new hybrid cable for RRU installations. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar is scheduled for one hour from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time today, Thursday, September 25th. The presentation is being recorded for replay. A link to the replay will be posted on the Comscope portal page on tesco.com. All lines will be on mute throughout the presentation. However, you may post a question at any time using the chat feature. We will answer as many questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. For those questions not answered, we will post a link to the answers on the test on the Comscope portal page on tesco.com. So look for an email advising when those links are live. Let's get started. 4G LTE allows wireless service providers to deliver greater signal strength, meaning more bandwidth, to powerful smartphones, tablets, and laptops that are driving demands for high-speed mobile data connections. 4G LTE radios are available in a split mount configuration with RRUs installed on the tower close to the antennas. RRUs connect to a baseband unit or BBU that is installed at ground level. Fiber optic cable connects the RRUs to the BBU. This arrangement is commonly referred to as fiber to the antenna, though it's really fiber to the RRU. The good news is that using fiber optic cable for those connections eliminates substantial RF losses associated with coaxial cables used to connect antennas with earlier generation radios. But installing fiber optic cables in an outdoor RF environment is challenging. Fiber cable requires special handling, and RRUs are active devices that require power. One solution is to install a hybrid cable with enough fiber optic strands and copper power lines in the same sheath for the number and type of RRUs being installed. Early versions of such hybrid cables require that each fiber and power connection had to be tailored and custom cut for each RRU at the site. So installations become complex and costly for a large number of RRUs. What's needed is a way to simplify RRU installations with connectorized hybrid cables that are easier to install and can reduce overall RRU deployment costs. And that's what we want to talk about today. Our presenter is John Williams, who is with the Wireless Business Unit at Comscope. John has over 30 years experience in the fiber optics industry with stints in operations, engineering, and sales and marketing. He is currently product line manager for Heliax Fiber Feed for the Americas region. I have been in telecom for over 25 years and have developed a lot of knowledge and expertise in public network infrastructure. Tesco is a leading wireless equipment distributor in North America, representing over 300 manufacturers and more than 25,000 products. We are partnered with industry-leading companies such as Comscope to deliver reliable, cost-effective wireless solutions at the lowest total cost of ownership. Comscope creates the infrastructure that connects people and technologies through every communications evolution. The company provides innovative optical and RF solutions that help service providers and operators plan, deploy, and maintain high-quality services to end users. And now I'll turn the presentation over to John. And please post your question um, uh, to the chat feature at any time during the presentation, and we'll get to get to them uh, at the end of the presentation uh, um, once we have all all of them in. Please stand by. John, take it away. Okay. Uh, John, not sure if I still have control over the uh, okay. slide advancement here. There you go. Okay, go got ahead, it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to echo John's welcome, and thank you all for taking the time to talk to us about this new technology. As you can see from the screen, 
the uh, challenges that face us in our industry um, that have developed over the past half dozen to 10 years can, can look overwhelming uh, with everything that's uh, evolving. And an interesting note is, when you think about it, we as wireless consumers really have been driving a lot of the changes to the network and have been uh, creating some of these challenges for the carriers that serve us. If you think back to the first cell phone that you got, uh, if you're old enough, it probably didn't have a camera on it. It certainly didn't have uh, a lot of modern applications on it. And we were happy to have those things just as, a, as an emergency to be able to make a phone call from the road without having to pull in and um, stop at a payphone, which uh, most payphones are probably getting close to becoming museum pieces now. Um, and over the time, those phones that we had evolved to the point where we could uh, text, the point where we could take pictures and send them back and forth. And then obviously with the advent of the smartphones, we had uh, applications for music, for watching videos, uh, downloading uh, information, uh, surfing the web, and we probably do that as we plug in our phone at night to charge it. Uh, we check our emails or we uh, check the weather or something before uh, before we turn in. And so a lot of industry experts have, have said that uh, we've evolved to the point where we really are no longer carrying cell phones, although we call them that. Instead, we're, we're carrying pretty sophisticated little mini computers around with us that have a phone application on it. And our use of these devices um, drives a, a lot of demand on data uh, in the form of uh, pure data or, or video from the, from the carriers. And that has caused them to uh, look at, at all kinds of ways they can boost their network capacity. One of those ways is through the use of remote radio units, and, and that's what we want to talk about today. If you are, are in the... Um, business where you are going to be working with someone, either installing a, a, a network or, or for them or, or planning, some of the considerations that uh, Comscope recommends are uh, listed on this next slide, and that is the radio manufacturer and the number of radios that are going to be deployed. Uh, that will determine a lot the interface that we'll talk about here in just a second. Uh, the number of radios is going to determine the uh, amount of power and fiber that you have to put up the tower or on the rooftop. Um, that next point, obviously, is, is an application where uh, the radios are going to be located and, and how we're going to reach them. Uh, the height is going to determine a lot about the uh, length of the products that you're going to need to deploy, uh, fiber mode and count. Uh, that's somewhat customer dependent on their uh, choice of a radio and also their desire for uh, spare fibers or their, their desire not to have spare fibers. Uh, the architecture at the baseband unit is going to determine uh, a lot about how you separate the cable uh, at the bottom of the tower inside the shelter. And finally, the customer's expansion plan uh, will drive the choice of the product. Uh, in other words, are they, are they happy with what they're putting up now, or do they want to be able to have the ability to grow the network in, in the near future? Uh, having said all that, uh, we've worked with a number of um, major carriers over the years in installing, helping install their, their wireless infrastructure with remote radio units. Um, typically, after they have some experience with installation, they come back to us and we've seen uh, a commonality in some of the questions that they, they ask us. One is, is there a way to simplify this process? Because pretty much up till now, everything's been a custom, um, customized design for the carrier. Uh, they ask us, is there a way to speed up the deployment? And finally, they want to know, is there a way that you can build in uh, future-proof inside the, the, the uh, trunk cable so that they're not going back constantly and having to, to put more up the tower? And these are questions that we, we put to our engineers, and, and the answer that we came up with in developing is what we call Heliax Fiber Feed Direct, which is the image that you can see on this, on this slide. Um, so as we go through the presentation, I'd like you to keep in mind these three concepts of simplification, speed to deployment, and, and making your network future-proof. Uh, we'll stick on the idea of simplification first, and the way we've done that uh, is by going with standardized configurations. So we, we've built configurations right now for three remote radio units and six remote radio units. We offer those in multiple wire gauges. 
So depending on the height of the tower or the, the length of the run that you have to make and the associated voltage drop with the radio, uh, you can choose the gauge that'll, that will work for your, your particular deployment. We offer a, a number of choices in uh, fibers, again, depending on uh, customer's desire whether or not to have uh, redundant fibers in, in case of emergency or, or repair. We offer our, our trunk lengths in uh, five meter increments. Uh, we always uh, recommend to the customer that when they, uh, when they specify the length that uh, they should be conservative. Uh, in other words, if they think they need a, uh, an 85 meter length, they might want to order a 90 meter length because while it's easy to adjust the length, to shorten the length of these cables in the field, uh, it's very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to make a short cable work in a longer environment. Uh, we have not invented a, a good cable stretcher as of yet. And then finally, uh, we simplify this by making uh, matching tails for the, the remote radio units. And that's an important consideration. Um, when you think of these customized um, designs that I've talked about before, part of the reason they're customized is that every radio manufacturer, um, their engineers put together what they feel is the best interface for that radio. But it differs from, uh, from manufacturer to manufacturer. Uh, it can differ in the way that the power is interfaced with the radio, whether it needs a, a power plug on the end of it. Uh, it can differ on the way that the fibers are waterproofed as they go into the radio. And so as, as these um, deployments went out, we had to take this into consideration in terms of the, the radio and, and, and design a lot around what was going on there. With Heliax Fiber Feed Direct, as we show on the right side, it really doesn't matter because the trunk cable we build is not going to care what, what radio is on the other end of it because we're going we're gonna to reach that radio with a, with a customized jumper for that particular um, for that radio design that we'll talk about in, in just a few more slides. So these are the way we work to simplify the, uh, the connections and to make this a, a lot less painless uh, as you're installing the network and operating the network. Next thing we talked about was speed, and um, when we talk about speed, uh, one of the things we want to talk about is how long does it take to uh, install the cable. With uh, Heliax Fiber Feed Direct, you can literally uh, make the connections in, in half the time it would take because you're making half the connections. And the way that we achieve that is by eliminating the need for a junction box. Junction box that you see on the left has a, a trunk cable coming in from the bottom. Uh, the you know, screw down terminals, you've got the power connected there, and then you can see on the right hand side coming in the bottom two jumpers that are going out to the various radios. Um, so it takes a, a while to wire those jumpers uh, into and the trunk into the junction box. It creates a, a potential point of failure, um, and it, it can be time consuming. So the way we've eliminated that is on the right-hand side with uh, the direct product, you can see a, a canister uh, towards the upper left of the uh, pictures you're looking at it. And inside that canister, we pre-wire uh, everything that, that needs to be done to, to reach the radios. So for example, you can see that the uh, three tails coming out the top are the, are the power cords that actually go directly to the radios. Um, and then on the bottom, you see six fiber, short fiber jumpers. Those come out of the canister, and they allow us to interface uh, with, with, those, uh, with those customized jumpers that I talked about that are going to be going to the radios. And we do this with, uh, we achieve this with a weatherproofed uh, outdoor type of uh, duplex LC connector. And um, when you, um, Put this connector together, uh, you get a, a very uh, satisfying click, uh, and you can also there's a feel to it. I know a lot of folks who uh, who work on towers have uh, have told me that it's difficult when you're 150 feet up in the air to to necessarily hear this click, but uh, it has a feel to it as the connectors uh, go into the groove that that match them up. One thing we always like to point out is that uh, before you make the connections of the tails with this trunk cable. Uh, you always want to clean your connectors. Uh, I, I can't overemphasize the importance of, of cleanliness of the connectors. 
Uh, there have been industry studies done. Uh, the most recent one was by uh, NTT Advanced Technologies, where they surveyed globally network operators and installers. And what they found was that in excess of 80% of the network operators said that uh, maintenance problems in their networks were caused by dirty fibers. Uh, interestingly enough, when they talked to the people who actually install it, uh, the, that number jumped up to over 90% of the problems that the installer saw were due to, uh, to dirty fibers. So uh, Tesco offers a, a number of, of cleaning uh, materials that you can, you can get, but you know, our, our guidance is always to clean the connector immediately before you're going to plug it in and then plug it in so that uh, you can't get uh, debris on it uh, anymore. The other advantage to uh, making the product future ready is the fact that there's less tower loading on it. And when you uh, think of less tower loading, uh, if you look at the junction box, you can see that it's rectangular. It's kind of like a sail out there in the wind when you think about it, as opposed to a cylindrical type of device. And a just engineer designer's rule of thumb is that when you go from a rectangular shape to a cylindrical, you're going to cut down on your, your tower loading uh, from a wind standpoint by about one-third. In future proofing, too, uh, the choices that we give with Heliax Fiber Direct uh, help people plan their network. So we go from the, the far left side where you can see an operator who is satisfied that they're going to put up uh, three radios and that's all they're going to need in their network, uh, to the middle where people are knowing they're going to need three but uh, potentially upgrade in the future. And then on the far right, uh, we have the uh, operator who says, my network has special needs. and and uh, when when there are special needs, that's when uh, you know we can bring uh, you can bring Tesco and Comscope in to talk about what the special needs are. Now, obviously, we've we've put a lot of effort into making the product standard so that it will work in a lot of in a lot of situations. It will work, work in most situations, but we do recognize that there are times when you're going to have um, special needs that that might not be uh, accommodated by one of these standard products. And uh, those are times when Tesco and Comscope are, are happy to talk to you about your network needs and, and uh, whether we can help you or not. The um, Heliax Fiber Feed Direct Cables are uh, managed up the tower by uh, all the standard accessories that you're used to working with, uh, either other hybrid cables or with uh, coaxial cables, uh, things like hoisting grips and grounding kits and hangers and uh, the grommets that go into hangers. and cable entry ports. Uh, all of those are available through Tesco and Comscope. In addition, uh, at, the, at the base of the tower, we have fiber management uh, equipment that uh, is used to uh, terminate the fiber uh, before it goes into the baseband unit or to facilitate its entry into the baseband unit and the management there. One uh, point that we typically like to uh, make about um, installation accessories as they relate to hybrid cables. And, and this really is any hybrid cable, not just the, uh, the direct that we're talking about. Um, these cables, because they contain a significant amount of, of copper, uh, weigh about twice what the, what the weight would be of an equivalent diameter coaxial cable is. So they're, they're pretty heavy cables. So there's some safety considerations uh, in terms of hoisting them and in terms of uh, attaching them to the tower. So we test our cables very extensively in our labs uh, in an environmental chamber to ensure that we match the, uh, the grips and the grommets uh, closely with the cables so that the cables uh, won't slip, uh, won't come out of place, and definitely won't fall uh, once they're installed. And so for safety considerations, uh, we always encourage uh, installers, we encourage uh, network owners that when they select a supplier for a hybrid product, that they use that supplier's accessories, just again from, from the consideration of, of overall safety of the installers and the personnel who are going to be working around it afterwards, and also for overall reliability to make sure that uh, things stay in place as they should for a number of years. So with that, um, we had our first uh, successful deployment uh, a little over a year ago, about a year and a quarter ago now. Uh, you can see it was a, a tower type of application. And uh, the canister that I mentioned before, you can see it mounted in the top right-hand picture there. 
uh, it's a it's a, fair, it's a very simple mount that comes with it. Uh, it takes a short time to for the installers to put that up on the tower and uh, get the radios plugged up and, and ready to operate. Now I'd like to run into uh, several applications examples of, of planning. Uh, if you're tasked to plan uh, a cable for a tower or rooftop applications, um, how you can do this with the ordering guide that Tesco can provide to you. We'll start out with a tower application. Uh, one of the things that you want to do is use a voltage calculator to determine the appropriate uh, wire gauge that, that you're going to need for the trunk. Now, um, most of the time you can get this information directly from the OEM. Uh, some of the OEMs have their own uh, voltage calculators and gauge calculators. Uh, I'm using one that we have internally. And an example here, I'm, I'm using a 200-foot tower. And when I plug in the, the numbers on the left that you see, uh, that determines is determined on the height uh, of the tower and, and the power the radio requires. It tells me that I need six gauge conductors, or if you're using metric, uh, you know, 10 millimeter squared conductors. So here we're going to use uh, six gauge conductors. Based on that and the length, uh, I can come up with a with a Comscope part number and an associated Tesco uh, SKU. So you can see the Comscope part number there is FDH 1206 12S50. 65M, and I've got a breakdown of what that part number means for you, uh, just so you know what goes into it. The FDH is really just kind of a product identifier for us. It tells us this is our, our direct product. The 1206 uh, lets you know the number of conductors in the gauge. So in this case, there are 12 six-gauge conductors. Uh, there are 12 single-mode fibers. The S is for single-mode. Uh, the breakout code is a 50 here. That really doesn't have a lot of meaning in the field. Uh, that really tells our manufacturing people how to build this so that the uh, tails at the top coming out of the canister the correct length and the breakout at the bottom where it's going to be plugged into the uh, baseband unit and the power distribution unit are correct. And in this case, the 50 is, is that standard product we talked about. And the last digits are the uh, length, in this case in meters. If you saw one of our part numbers and it did not have that M, uh, it would mean it was designated in feet. Uh, once you've determined what trunk you need, next thing you need to know is, is what uh, fiber tail you're going to need to interface that trunk to the radio. Now, I've given three examples here on this slide, uh, but literally this is the part that, that we customize. This is the only part that has to be customized the system, and we can interface to inter any radio uh, that you choose to use. I've got uh, just a couple of examples here. so. In this case, our breakout codes designate the radios that the, uh, we interface the trunk with. So uh, breakout code 100 is for Ericsson radios, 101 is for Huawei, and 102 that we have in this example is NSN. Standard lengths are uh, up to 5 meters in 1 meter increments. Uh, we've been asked, can we go longer than that? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, in those cases, the challenge may become uh, getting the power to the radio. So we try to match the fiber jumper up to the length of the, of the power that's, that we can uh, reach out to the radio with. So in the, in the example that we used, if we assumed our Ericsson radios uh, are being used, we could pick a part number and an associated Tesco SKU. In this case, it'd be a DFJ 2S100 to indicate Ericsson radios there. And then we chose a five meter jumper and uh, knowing that they're putting up six remote radio units, you would order a quantity of six of these. Moving on to uh, rooftop. Rooftops are a little bit different, and the, the reason that they can be more complex is the, the distance that can be involved uh, between sectors. So typically, uh, the way that we handle this is by specifying a three remote radio unit trunk for each sector based on those lengths. Um, now, in, in some instances, uh, this means that there will be spare power and fiber for future growth. Uh, in some instances, you may see uh, up to three radios deployed per sector, and it may actually consume that, uh, that complete trunk at that time. So uh, you, you calculate the gauge requirements the same as you would for uh, the, the tower uh, that we did. Uh, in this example, we can assume there are varying sector lengths, as we talked about, 240 feet, 160 feet, and 320 feet. Voltage calculator tells us, again, we're going to need six-gauge conductors. Um, so we pick, we pick uh, 
the trunk lengths that are closest to that. In that case, we'd have uh, 75 meters, 50 meters, and 100 meters, as you can see. And uh, since we're talking about three remote radio units, you're only going to need to have six of those six-gauge conductors going to each sector. You're not going to need uh, a total of 12 anymore. Uh, so there's our three part numbers. It, it falls out that uh, uh, in this case the customer wanted some spare fibers, so we have enough in each sector to feed three radios with uh, six spare fibers remaining. Fiber tails are selected exactly the same way for the tower application. You need to know the radio that you're going to interface with. Uh, in this case, we'd need six fiber tails to support the six remote radio units. And again, assuming Ericsson radio, you'd have the, the DFJ 2S100 uh, 5 meter along with uh, our, our associated Tesco SKU there. Now going to some of the issues you see in the field. I mentioned early on in the program that you want to be conservative when you order a trunk because you don't want to come up short. There's several ways to manage the length of the cable in the field, and, and they're all relatively simple. Um, in this slide, you can see that the operator has told the installer it's okay to just coil the excess trunk length at the bottom of the tower. When you do that, you want to make sure that you observe the uh, minimum bend radius of the cable and you secure the, the cable coil with six equally, pla equally placed uh, cable tie wraps, as, as shown in the, the slide here. Uh, many operators prefer not to have that exposed cable at the bottom of the tower, uh, again, for, for safety and reliability purposes. So we've made the cable that can be easily adjusted in the field. The way we do this is by leaving rip cords outside of the cable jacket. Uh, those rip cords, cords are made out of Kevlar. Kevlar is a very tough, strong material. It's the same thing that's in uh, a lot of these bulletproof jackets. Um, and so it, it will easily rip through the armoring and the outer jacket of the cable. And you can see that in the second picture where they've, they've been able to literally uh, pull the rip cords back and then peel back the jacket and the armor just like a banana peel. Once you've done that, the individual components, the power components and the fiber, uh, are in smaller units, and you can wrap them uh, easily inside uh, excess storage boxes, such as is shown in the, in the bottom of this slide. Most of the time, you're going to blunt cut those power conductors to length. Um, so in other words, you're going you're to cut them, you're going to strip them, and, you, and they're going to go into a, some form of screw-down terminal, or you're going to put a lug on them, and they're going to go into a terminal. Uh, <clears throat> since all the fibers are pre-connectorized, uh, one of the things you want to pay particular attention to in the field is being careful not to cut a fiber versus a, a power conductor. Um, if the fiber is cut, um, most of the time the operator uh, again, for liability purposes, purposes, will not want it to be either fusion spliced to a pigtail or uh, field terminated. So in that case, the, the trunk would have to be sent back uh, to the factory for repair. So uh, just a little word of uh, caution there when you do adjust the length of these things on the bottom, pay particular attention to uh, separating the, the fiber out from the power conductors before you start to make those adjustments. Um, also, like to take, talk a, about a little bit about the support that uh, Tesco and Comsco uh, support, uh, provide as, as uh, partners. Uh, one of the things you'll notice when you see our fiber uh, components arrive on site is that they all come with a hard copy of the factory test results. Those uh, factory test results uh, are important in uh, closeout documentation for many of the operators. And, uh, and also letting you know that you got a product that uh, was looked at and certified good by Comscope before it came to the field. If for some reason uh, that paperwork is lost and you need to retrieve it, there are several ways that you can do it. First, you can go on to Comscope's website, and under uh, Tools, there's WebTrack. WebTrack will pull those test results back up for you in uh, an Acrobat document that you can print off or you can save to your hard drive for uh, use in an electronic package, an electronic submission. If you're in the field and you're wanting to troubleshoot, uh, you can actually do it on uh, an, an iPad or iPhone with uh, what we call C-Track. And uh, recently, since this slide has been uh, put out, we also have it available for Android devices, so you can download uh, C-Track from there. 
And what that allows you to do is pull up the, the test data, again, if you're in the middle of, of troubleshooting a product. And the way that you uh, retrieve it is that in addition to getting the, the test data with each assembly, each assembly has its own serial number. And that factory test data is linked back to that uh, serial number on the assembly so that you can easily retrieve it and uh, uh, check out those test uh, data. We also offer uh, online self-paced training courses. Now, Comscope Infrastructure Academy offers literally hundreds of courses that uh, cover everything from the basics of fiber optics to uh, antenna theory. Uh, one that we've come out with recently, earlier this year, as you can see, is, is fiber to the antenna. And it goes into a little bit more detail on the design, uh, on the components, and on some uh, hints for managing the, the fiber products in the field. If you choose to uh, take advantage of Comscope Infrastructure Academy, uh, one of the benefits is that you can request uh, an identification badge uh, that has the Comscope Infrastructure Academy logo on it and a certification that you've actually completed these courses uh, along with uh, your picture so that uh, you know if you're, if you're bidding on a job, if you're going in to uh, present, uh, you can show that as documentation that, in fact, uh, if the customer is using Comscope products, that you, you've been trained thoroughly on the use of the Comscope products in the deployment. Uh, finally, we have field engineering services. Uh, we're on a regional basis. We have trained engineers who have uh, decades of experience in the wireless industry that are available to assist either on the phone, if it's a simple uh, question, or if you run into a problem, they can typically be on site with you in uh, 48 hours or less. And this is a service that's provided at, at no cost. It's, it's part of the service that Comscope uh, feels uh, we owe to customers as, uh, as we support them in, in new technology and in these new products. So in, in summary, before we open up for questions, um, you know, when, when we talk about uh, you know, Comscope and Tesco working together, uh, you, know, you can think of uh, a lot of experience, uh, technology leadership, the fact that we offer full turnkey solutions and the fact that we have uh, capacity uh, in our factories that can expand. So it's, uh, if you have a project that's going to start out, it may be uh, you know, 50 sites, but you're concerned because it's going to go up to 600 sites next year, uh, you can rest assured that uh, Tesco and Comscope can flex our capacity and inventories to cover you in, in all of your needs. Um, and with that, uh, John, I, I am finished. I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, we have a, a couple of questions I'd like to get to. Um, uh, first question is, um, is surge protection built into the cable? Not in the uh, Heliax Fiber Feed Direct. The, the, uh, Service providers who typically use this design uh, do two things. One is most of the radio OEMs build in some form of surge protection in the radio. And at the base of the tower, uh, the operators will typically put in a third-party uh, surge protection device uh, before the product goes into the baseband unit. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Uh, so that, that would be in, in that... Um box or the, the termination at the bottom of the tower? It would be, John, and, and a lot of times it's, it is a, you know, a actual, actually a separate box that's uh, inside the shelter or near the cabinet as it goes mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, <clears throat> just reminding everyone, if you have any questions, uh, please just uh, shoot us uh, one on the, the chat feature and uh, we'll uh, present it to John for a response. But uh, another question is, um, how is the jumper anchored into the canister. You talked about you know, making the fiber connection and listening for the click, but uh, how is it physically uh, uh, connected up there? Um, a couple things. Uh, one is where that short jumper comes out of the canister, that's, that's merely an extension of the, of the fiber cable coming through that canister uh, with some strain relief on it, obviously. So that short jumper is strain relieved, strain relieved into the canister. Um, the fiber tail we talked about is going to be connectorized with uh, a duplex LC outdoor connector uh, to that short jumper. And then you would use, uh, 
for example, half-inch cable hangers to support it as it goes to the remote radio unit. Uh, and then it's uh, it's interfaced. Uh, however, the the radio OEM uh, specifies that we put the fiber and power connectors on the that uh, the tail to accomplish that. So, uh, you know, one uh, radio manufacturer might have a, a special weatherproof boot that uh, that goes on, and and that will come on that customized jumper. Another one might have uh, the ability to take the that duplex LC connector and put it inside the cavity of the radio. In that case, there's no special weatherproofing that has to go on that end uh, because it, it, it's going inside a, a grommet to, and it's weatherproofed at that point. So, you know, it's um, connected to the radio, it's connected at that short jumper, and it's supported in between by uh, uh, normal hangers and grommets. Just a follow-up question. Where there's capacity, where you don't have a dumper on one of the connections, is, uh, is there a weatherproof cap over that, or how is that covered over to get ready for um, future uh, installations? That's an excellent point. The, when the canister comes, uh, all of those short fiber jumpers that are coming out the top have a weatherproof cap on it. It's, uh, it's an IP67 rated cap, which means it's been tested for uh, both water intrusion and dust intrusion. And again, from the standpoint of uh, cleanliness and, and reliability, John, we recommend that those caps remain in place, um, particularly if you're thinking of future growth, until such time as you're ready to make that uh, final connection to the fiber tail. Then you take the dustproof, waterproof cap off at that time, do the cleaning that we talked about, and make your final connection of that fiber tail to the radio. Um, a related uh, application, I guess, uh, here's a question, um, I guess we're going from the vertical to the horizontal here, but is there a configuration for ion DAS remotes? Um, I, I think he's talking uh, about I, hybrid, fiber configuration. Right, yeah. One thing I'll have to tell you is I'm not an expert on, on DAS, that, that we've got a, a whole separate uh, group in our company that does DAS, but I will tell you that uh, they, ha they do have a group that works on uh, special configurations of, uh, of wiring for the DAS products. I just, I, you know, I apologize. I can't really address them because I'm not that familiar with them. Okay. Fair but if, if there's um, a follow-up, if there's a follow-up question, though, I can certainly uh, steer you to the right people inside our company that can uh, can follow up with you on that. Uh, maybe we'll take advantage of that and, and get an answer to our questioner um, uh, for. Um, to give them a little more detail on that. But. Okay, uh, John, I don't see any more questions on the line. Uh, so at this point, I think we'll um, go ahead and wrap it up. We thank everyone for uh, their time this afternoon, and uh, I hope that you found this informative. Uh, and please uh, contact us if you have further questions, and we'll be happy to get into details. So with this, we'll wrap up the webinar, and um, have a good day. Thanks.